ready. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit record. Okay. And let's do that thing where we record the uh, that promo that we were talking about. So uh, whenever you're ready, go okay. ahead. Okay. Why don't you give me give me the script again? Do you mind giving me the script again? I do not mind giving you the script again. It's uh, you're saying something like, "Hi, this is Carlos Rosales from 10x for 10xforchrist.org," and you can do that any way you like it. Um, and you are listening to Jeff Smith on Vroom Vroom Beer. Hold tight. <laughs> It's going to be a bumpy okay. ride. You know, whatever. <laughs> Just have fun with it. Okay. okay. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. Hello. This is Carlos Rosales with 10X for Christ, discovering your 10X lifestyle in Jesus Christ. I'm here today with Jeffrey Smith with Vroom Vroom Veer, and I'm really excited today. So hold on. Let's get started. Perfect. That was awesome. Way to ad lib. You. you did a good job. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm going to hit stop. I'm going to start a new file. I'll be right back. Okay. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. David Wood, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Veer and welcome to the show. How's it going? I'm good, Jeff. Thanks for having me here. So you are at playforreal.life. I love that. I like the dot life part. <laughs> so talk a little yeah. bit about what you're most excited about in your business today. Ooh, I like that question. Well, I'm excited about tough conversations right. because we tend to run away from them. And I understand that. We're creatures of comfort. Yeah. But there's so much gold lying in there. And I don't, I don't know many people who don't want better results in business and life. And by ignoring our tough conversations, we're skipping over so many great results, like more clients, deeper connections. And I, I love personal growth and seeing right. people dive into their courage and being willing to be vulnerable with another human mm. for the gold that lies on the other side. So that's what I'm most excited about right now. And particularly we're going into corporations. So I do this with individuals, but also with teams and companies, it's horrendously expensive to have people not airing their issues, not right. talking about what needs to be talked about. Right. Because ultimately performance suffers and people quit. So I'm very excited about um, bringing that into companies. That's amazing. You know, I, I've often thought like um, there's all sorts of what, what, a, a lot of people refer to this buried treasure that they don't know about, you know, inside them, you know, and you can find those. Um, yeah. The tough conversations. I think you and I had a pre-show pre -show chat, I think. Uh, and we agreed that um, when you asked me, hey, maybe we can do a demo of one of these tough conversations. I couldn't think of one. Right. So I think one of your new um, ideas is helping people find those tough conversations that they don't really have awareness about. Yeah. 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 I think, I think the mind is sneaky. The mind. It is. The mind won't even present to us, oh, you could talk to Bill about how he shows up late to meetings all the time. Yeah. Or you could <laughs> talk, talk to right. your husband about, um, something that, that he's doing that's bugging you or something you want more of in your marriage. The mind doesn't normally present it that way. It just presents it. The ego presents it as complaint. Oh, I don't like how someone does this. I don't like that. I wish my boss wasn't so overbearing. It's like that. And it's my job to say, <clears throat> that's a clue. Yes. Anytime, anytime you're not liking what someone's doing or not feeling great about your relationship with the person mm. or you're complaining to someone else. You're mm. gossiping about it. Right. That's a clue. Ah, there's a tough conversation here. I just have to find out what it is right. and, then, and then find an artful way. So it's two steps. Find what it is and then two, find an artful way to have that conversation Yes. so that we go further. Yeah. You know, I, I know this. I, I was 
had a situation at work. We're going to get into roomy very stuff, but this is a really fun conversation. I just thought of something. So one of the, have you ever uh, checked out the uh, 48 laws of power? No, no, it's a really good book, but I won't get too into it right now, but I can, I can uh, generally apply these in work scenarios a lot. I think one of the laws that I like is never outshine the master. <laughs> okay. There's a lot to that rule, but it's basically like if somebody's in a boss position over you, right. And they don't necessarily need to be your direct boss, just anybody like higher in the food chain, right. You never want to make them look bad ever. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I think we can all agree on that. Right. So I, I remember, um, having this scenario and kind of tripping over that, right. In a, in a, I was just trying to help this person, you know, I, I'm helping federal employees do their, their work. Um, and, uh, and I help them sort of like do their it stuff. Right. So this issue had come up before and I kind of tripped over and I didn't do it artfully, right? <laughs> is why I bring it up, right? I kind of just fumbled through it. Um, and then I was like, okay, we've done this like two or three times now. How can I do this better, right? Because I, I know she already knows how to fix this herself. I just need to make her, give her enough information um, so she can figure it out herself and make the win hers, Right. And I did it. Yeah, I just backed up and went, what does she really need to remember? And I said it like, I'm going to come over in, a, in about five minutes, but I think you remember you just have to do this. And then, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. well hearing, hearing that, it sounds like the trip up was you you spoke up, but did it in a way that, that didn't have her feeling empowered or right. feeling acknowledged, yes. right, recognized. Right, right. Yes. So th there's a four-step process that I teach. There's a four-step blueprint which can help you get out of trouble with these oh, tough nice. conversations, give you a roadmap. That's perfect. And and um, Yeah, and because it's hard to do on the fly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah don't try that. <laughs> In fact, people don't try that. That's why the mind doesn't bring it up as a conversation because we just assume it's, it's going to be a train wreck. Right. But um, you and I will give away this at the end of the show. So listeners, you, 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 you know, you'll get the four-step blueprint. But I'll, I'll mention a couple of things that could help you avoid that problem of the person feeling like they're being attacked. Um, <clears throat> one is uh, in the worksheet that comes with the free download, you'll write down things like, what's my hope for this conversation? And perfect. you'll actually share yeah, that with perfect. the person. Right. Like, Ooh. like I'm sharing that I'm bringing this up with you because my hope is we'll be more efficient at doing this and there'll be less problems or you know, whatever. Right. So they get on board with, Oh, that sounds like a good thing. I want to be in on that. And then you might also mention your fear or concern and you'll write that down on the worksheet. What could go wrong? Um, she might feel defensive. Right. She might feel attacked. Like I'm, I'm being, like I'm right. being crazy. Or powerless right, right. and I don't want that that's not my intention so right. um but you might mention that you know I'm, I hesitant to bring it up because this could happen and I don't want that um and I think it's worth talking about so that my hope can come to fruition so the the blueprint will, can really help you avoid some of those classic mistakes where the other person feels disempowered and there are some pro tips on the on the blueprint and one of them is to own your experience Okay. And those sound like complex words, but it's really just instead of telling the other person about what they're doing or what they're doing wrong, you speak about your own experience. Hey, when you do that, I feel a bit frustrated because I'm seeing an easier way. And I, you know, sure. I, I just, I don't want you to waste your time doing that. I want you to um, have the short route to success. And so I wanted to speak up. That's good. I like all of those things. I, now that now that we're having this conversation, I can really <clears throat> I can see where I a couple of folks that I need to have these chats with. But I'm going to use that blueprint. <laughs> yeah, thank yeah. you. And I've, I've I've had a realization recently. A lot of people are thinking, "Oh, I don't have any tough conversations, or I don't know what they are." Sometimes this these they're quite small. Right. They don't exactly. Have to be yes, they're huge. tiny. Yeah. Like, they don't need we've to be got, earth shattering. Yeah. Like yeah. We've got the, things, right. There is the big category. Like I coach right. someone who, who went and confessed to a burglary they committed 20 years ago. That's a really big one. Right. Um, I've done illegal stuff in my life and I've gone and confessed to a crime and risked prison for right. it. 
So, you know, those are the big ones. Or when I was 18, I cheated on my first serious girlfriend and told her about it and she broke up with me. Like these are the big ones. Right. But you've also got small ones that you might not even think of tough conversations. Like when I offered a coaching session to someone and they didn't show up for the session and then use my booking link to just reschedule it for the next week. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm, <laughs> something, I'm not feeling good about it. That was my clue, right? right? I'm not feeling good about this. I didn't know why. I just knew I didn't feel good about it. And it took me half an hour to unpack it, go through the worksheet and go, oh, I feel like my time's not being respected. Right, right. And, and I slighted, yes. Yeah, and I need to have, I need to just feel that my time's being respected for me to be willing to rebook it. So I took a risk and I followed the blueprint and I had the conversation. Um, or someone else uh, wrote to me a couple of days ago and I thought I was a hero, that I'd done something nice for them. They didn't like how I'd done it. And they, uh. they sent these three criticisms and um, I could have just shut down and said, you know, or, or I could have fought back. But I was like, no, here it is. This is a tough conversation. Um, right. So as you start to practice, you start seeing, oh, wait, any of those little places where I feel contracted, right. that's a clue. I think, I think you, what you just said is true is because when you first asked me, like, hey, let's do this demo, I, my mind went to those things where you admit, like, your deepest, darkest secret, <laughs> right? That's, that's where my mind went, right, immediately. Something huge, and, like, and I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to do that. I can't even think of one right now. But you're right. Now that, now that you're saying, okay, I bring up the example of this little tiny thing, it's almost like how to have a conversation without to, – to resolve a little situation and make things better – um, for, for somebody else and you don't want to, you don't want to make them feel bad or hurt their feelings kind of idea. Right. Yeah. Or, or you don't want to be judged. Right. Like, Same like idea. this, right. Yeah. Like this guy who I, I felt disrespected by, he's a podcast host. Right. And I could have, um, he might've said to people in the industry, this guy's oversensitive. He's high maintenance. He's a jerk. Right. There was a risk. So, you know, th there are risks in having tough conversations. I'm just making the point, the upside is often really big and we don't see it. So right. do the worksheet, well, yeah. first start to identify them and then do the worksheet on them and you'll realize, wait, I might get to feel, uh, like with this pod podcast host, he loved me bringing it up so much and was so impressed. He wants to include that in our interview. So that's perfect. <clears throat> that's, yeah. That's like the ideal situation that you probably didn't even foresee. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and then, and then we did reschedule the session because he said, I do really respect your time and you're right. I totally messed that up and we did do the session and now I feel like we're closer than we were before. Right. So that's usually the upside that's waiting there, but you got to take a risk to get there. Sure. Sure. So um, I know now we've gotten into the show and uh, we, ha we have to do a little bit of room, room beer storytelling. <laughs> We're having Good. a blast. Yeah. So yeah. let's just go back in time and talk about where you grew up. Where are you from? Uh, I'm just writing down something I said because I really liked it. There's <laughs> <laughs> a huge upside to tough conversations, but you have to take a risk to get there. Yes. That's a good note taker. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Take that note. Yeah, so Vroom Vroom Veer and where did I grow up? I grew up in uh, a town, a country town in Australia called Cessnock, which is about two hours from Sydney. Okay, wow, Sydney. All right, I've never <laughs> been to Australia. I have an Australian friend who's invited me to come out, and my wife has been everywhere. <laughs> okay, so what was it? What 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 was it like growing up in? I guess you could call it like rural Australia. Well, I, I guess I'll tell the story through the lens of Vroom Vroom Veer because yeah, I like perfect. this this model and yeah. I like this this perspective. So, um, uh, so I think I can blend that in. I uh, I, I felt like it was a rough upbringing. Um, when I was seven, my little sister was killed in a traffic accident. Oh my goodness! And I was there at the time. Wow. I saw it happen. Our parents weren't around, and I didn't know that it had an impact on me until I was about 23. Sure. Uh, but, wow. I, but I was fairly lonely as a kid. 
And uh, I, I'd often, I didn't know how to talk to girls. I didn't know how to stand up to bullies. And uh, kids are often unkind at school, but particularly in country towns, I think it can be worse. Right. <clears throat> so uh, I wasn't one of the cool kids. I was a bit of a dork. I ended up coming top of the school. So at least I had that going for me. Okay. Uh, an an academic the, nerd, um, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't have the emotional intelligence or the social skills right. for how to really thrive in groups. And I found that really hard. And then I, I, I was on... I guess I was kind of in vroom vroom mode because I was great at math. I right. taught the school in math as as well. And um, what do you do when you're good at math? Well, maybe you become an accountant. I figured right. that's what I'll do. And then I found out about something called an actuary, which is apparently, well, not apparently, it's, it's harder, way harder to qualify than an accountant. Mm. And they get paid more and there's more prestige. So I thought, well, why not go for the top? Uh-huh. Yeah, And then I found out okay. that um, some companies were offering scholarships to people who would go and study this. So I got paid to go to university and such was demand. It was an unbonded scholarship, meaning I could take three years of financial support from the company and then go and work for somebody else. Huh, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, it was extraordinary. Yeah. So, so I, was, I was kind of, I would say on vroom vroom mode because I was just like, that's the natural path. That's what I'm going to do. And then I took a veer, uh, at, I think I was about 21, and I wanted to travel. And that's what Australians are real. Australians and Germans are really known for traveling. And when we do travel, we don't do, do a little trip. And I think it's because it's so far to go anywhere. <laughs> right. It might as well keep on going. Yeah. And around the world tickets are, are fairly cheap. So instead of just going to, say, the U.S. and back, for another 500 bucks, you can get 10 stops around the world and come back to Australia. Oh, wow. I need to do so, that. Yeah. So we tend to do, we, you know, we don't, we don't have South America right at our doorstep. So I took a whole year and then came back to work. They were, they said, we will hold your job for you. Wow. So I, I came Amazing. back and then I did another, then I did another veer because I realized I love to travel, but I can't afford to keep taking a year off. I don't have the money. Right, right. Okay. So my insight was I want to live in another country and work. And I started asking questions. How do I do that? How do I get a transfer? Because I was with an international company. Is it possible to get a transfer overseas and then I'll be in another culture? And that actually happened. It was a bit of a miracle. <laughs> okay. But I got transferred to Park Avenue. Whoa. And got nice. to work as an actuary, which I didn't say what that is. I'm sorry. Um, an actuary works with long-term financial projections and statistics. Yeah, um, usually I think of an insurance company. Yeah, they, yeah. they set the insurance premiums, uh, right. superannuation, pension funds. So right. I, you could tell I me was, like uh, you use like a, a bunch of data and spreadsheets and say like, OK, Jeff, if you fill out this form, you're going to die when you're 72 of a heart attack. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> it's, it's unlikely that would happen from filling out the form, but I think I know where you're heading. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. And and I got to work with some big name companies. Like I was with one of the biggest consulting firms in the world. So I got to go to Sony Music and hang with vice presidents. I got to go to Chanel, uh, Ford, Exxon, Philip Morris, work with some really big names. Wow. Um, so I did a veer. But then I was again on vroom vroom mode for for a few years, just doing working the in New York and yeah, doing the corporate ladder thing until the right. next until, until the, the next, next beer, beer, which was a big one. Okay, wow. So okay, I, I wanted to step out here and say, good for you that you got to go and uh, and do some travel, and then not only travel but like work. So that kind of happened to me uh, when I was. Uh, 18 years old and I joined the Air Force. My first Air Force assignment was Japan, right? So how how awesome is that? And was what? Japan. Oh, right. Right. So I get to yeah. go and live in Japan for 2 years uh, as an 18-year-old. So that that's amazing, you know, that basically the way I look at it is like for men, women are a little bit different, but your developmental brain is still you're still in childhood when you're 18 and 19 and 20. Right. So living in Japan is now part of my childhood. And that's amazing. You know, just because of it just throws everything about um, culture and the way things 
are gone about and it just turns it upside down. It's like, oh, so okay, in Japan, you know, the bathrooms are completely different. The toilets are completely, di everything's different, right? So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't imagine for you, like the difference between Australia and the United States, not, not as dramatic, but still no. a big deal though. It's, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't as dramatic as Japan uh, or Bali. I've lived in Indonesia now mm. and also Colombia. Bali is a big deal. <laughs> That's very different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that was another. That was another big view yeah. too. But 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 what was exciting was being in New York and working on Park Avenue. Yeah, that's going, huge. That going into these big companies and getting flown to Switzerland and like that was that was exciting for me. Plus, and I got introduced. In your 20s. To stuff. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm 23. Yeah, and I got introduced to things that I would have taken me a lot longer to find in Australia. I'm very progressive and alternative. I'm looking for, if it's something's new and alternative and scary, I want to try it out. Right. So in New York, I discovered open relationships, also known as polyamory. Right. I discovered, um, I discovered the world of BDSM. And right. the cult <laughs> scene. Sure. It was like, wow. Yeah. Um, I discovered big business. I discovered a place called the Moore House, which teaches about man woman dynamics and 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 what women really want. I'm like, wow, this is such an eye opener. <laughs> so I'm grateful, right? To, right, just the exposure. To all of, yeah, right, yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so all right, so you're in corporate world for how long? Yeah, I was there for four years. Okay, I'd gotten promoted. I had my own office. I mean, wow. things are going well. Presumably, I would have become a partner in in a few years. And you're still in your twenties. You're like yeah, I'm twenty nine now. Something. I'm like twenty six now. Twenty six now. Okay. And then the next veer happened. I wasn't happy in my in my marriage, and I um, someone suggested a personal development course. And they were saying my wife should do it. But the more I heard about it, the more I thought, I, th I should do that. I don't know much about myself. I, I had a judgment that people who did self-help were weak-willed and easily manipulated and that people selling courses and self-help were just out to prey on them. Okay. That was my, my model. But I was still pulled to at least do one course and get out. Uh, despite the, them all wearing name tags and smiling way too much. It felt very cultish. But <laughs> I went and did it, and they cracked open my cynicism, and I realized they really do care about the world. Like, they devoted their lives to having the world be better, and I didn't know that that existed. Okay. And, and I couldn't help coaching people during the course. So people, I, I, I'm a logical guy, and someone would get stuck, and I'd say, well, do you, have you tried what the – teacher said yesterday and i changed somebody's life overnight wow yeah it was extraordinary um her husband had, had an affair 10 years earlier and she'd been using that to manipulate and control him for 10 years wow doesn't sound like a happy marriage no right right, right. um and then I find out that she had an affair 10 years earlier, but she hadn't told him that piece of information. Aha. Wow. Okay. So watching her in, as she's in tears, look like realize what she'd done and start to look at risking her marriage to tell the truth and to get on an even playing field was extraordinary and beautiful. And she went and did it. Mm. And she came back and she said, talk about a tough conversation. Yeah. Right? Wow. That's up there. Right. And she came back and said, she reported to the whole group that her and her husband felt like they were floating on air six feet above the ground for the entire weekend. Totally in yeah. love. Oh, can you imagine though? Just, I mean, I'm thinking about it and I'm trying to put myself in her, in her shoes and his shoes. And can just the, the weight, it would feel like, yeah, like floating is the best word because I can imagine oh, had it been yeah. me carrying that baggage around both of them. Right. Cause he's feeling yes. hurt and powerless and she's feeling like probably unconsciously guilty. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And she didn't even yeah. know. And, and, and she's holding on to this power over him too. 
which is yeah, kind of you, that dirty kind of power, that shameful, guilty power. Exactly. I can't yeah. overstate that that weight. Yeah, I've, I've I've had an experience where I've carried around something for years and years, and yeah. finally confessed it and felt free. Right. Um, you can't put a price on that. So I took this um, experience of the coaching and. Uh, ended up doing two more courses, even though I said I'll never do any more self-help. I did two more courses because I found out they would co- they would train me in coaching if I did the third program. They would show me how to coach people going through that program. Oh, nice. Okay. And so I, I had to do that because I was hooked on this coaching stuff now. Right. And, um, and then I, someone, I decided – I needed to go back. Here's another via. I decided to go back to Australia because I felt like uh, I was getting divorced and I didn't feel like I had the community and friendships that I wanted in New York. I was like, I need a change. I'll go back to Australia. So I quit my job and I thought if I had six months off before I dived back into the corporate world, what would I do? And this is a great question to ask yourself anytime you're in transition between jobs. In a VR mode, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized I'd always admired those guys at the ski fields and in bars who would wear a black Afro and play blame it on the boogie uh, (laughs) on the guitar or get the whole bar singing the piano man. Okay. And um, I just admired that. It's like they're they're combining music, which I loved with entertainment. Right. And I always wanted to do that. So I went, went and got a singing lesson, bought myself a couple of big speakers and two weeks later, I had my first gig for 50 bucks at a squash court. They had a little bar in the corner of the squash court. And the guy said, I'll pay you 50 bucks to, for your first gig. Wow. So that's I a, did that. That's a good gig. Anytime you get your first gig that pays, that means it's legit, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 And and look, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I'm not a good singer. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> I'm not a good singer. I'm a good entertainer. So I rarely got asked back to the same place twice. <laughs> but I'm but also it a good matter, really. But I'm also a good marketer. So in right. a year and a half, I, I brought in 10 grand. Wow. In Eng- and That's I got crazy. myself on national TV on the Australian version of the Gong Show. And if you like, we can put a link to that in the in the show notes. <laughs> I embarrassed great. myself yeah. in the kilt. <laughs> On national TV, uh, and I got to play. I want to see the. A, I want to see the clip for sure. Oh yeah, you do. Yeah, Mr. Woody uh, was my stage name, and 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 I got to play on a um, a boat full of bachelorettes. Uh, okay. It's called Wild Boys Afloat, and I got to be on there. There were a uh, hundred women, all there to support women getting married. Five strippers, male strippers. Oh, great. And me as the musical entertainment. <laughs> and I got paid oh, to be on that boat. That's awesome. So it was it was really amazing. It. Yeah. And then it was during that time that I got um, – I met a guy who was coaching for a living. He, he, he was just getting started. He was doing a training program. And I said, wait, people are getting paid for coaching? This, right. is, this was back in 1998. Okay. And I said, so coaching wasn't really a thing that much. No, it wasn't really a thing yet. Yeah. Um, but he was doing a course and I, I've been, ever since I'd gotten the taste of the coaching, I was like, I have to do that. So I never went back to being an actuary. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah. I did, I did do some consulting on the side to make money. Right. Wow. But not a, as a job, not as a, you're right. Right. I, act, I actually never took a job since 97. When I quit my first consulting job, I have never been employed. Wow. Well, that's, that's a congratulations right there. <laughs> Thank you. It's, I didn't even know it at the time. All I was going to do was go and play guitar for six months and then get back into the corporate world. Nice. I had no idea that I would end up being a coach for the rest of my life. Wow. That's amazing. That's a that, great story. So thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. So there were some things that I, I that I wanted to mention as you do that. So like in, in my past, I, um, I noticed things about me now. I never, I kind of like to sing karaoke, <laughs> right? And I've also, um, I tried, um, up comedy once in my life. 
So for a long time when I was in high school, I thought, okay, you know, maybe I want to be a stand-up comedian, right? And then when well, you it, do like to laugh. I love to laugh, but there's a story here, right? So and and I've heard this the my experience echoed in in as I'm watching like a TV shows like comedians and cars getting coffee with Jerry Seinfeld, there's all these comedians talking about their their journey and their growth as either a comedian or a comedic actor or some sort of comic kind of profession. And I think it was uh, Seth Rogen, right? In high school in Canada, I think he dropped out of high school when he was 17 and he started doing stand up, right? And then he, he kept doing stand up until he met a comedian that really wanted to do stand up. And he was like, oh, I don't think I really want to do stand up. <laughs> that was exactly yeah. my experience because I did it once and it was really, it was hard in two ways. It was really hard for me to sit down and want to write down jokes. I don't, I didn't like that. Okay. <laughs> That's not how I want to be funny. I would rather be funny like Howard Stern where he's just having a conversation and laughing and occasionally being funny spontaneously, but not preparing yeah. a, a, a prepared stand-up thing is something that – I did it once. I did it that one time in a base talent show and – the writing, I agree with I, you. I didn't like it. I didn't like the writing of the jokes. I didn't like the telling of the jokes. And I didn't do it very well. And I was like, okay, now I know I don't want to do this. <laughs> but I had to go through it at least once to figure that out. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I resonate with that. I, I've done 20 stand-up gigs really? in my life. Okay. In, inclu including it's really a, hard. Yeah. Including a couple of professional comedy clubs, which was the easiest Okay. It's, it's, it's the bars where people are there for a meal and they haven't paid anything for comedy and they're trying to have a conversation and, and you're, you're trying and you're to, trying to win their attention. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I too don't like, uh, I don't, I, I like the writing of the jokes, but I don't like telling the same jokes over and over. I can't yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, right. it's I like kinda, a magic trick. Yeah. One day I hope I'll get to do improv comedy Yeah, and, improv and just I would talk like. to people. Yeah. Right. Just talk to people and see what naturally arises. I've been a little, I did a little bit, but I was a bit scared to try and rely on it. And that could be fun. It's well, to me, I like what you're saying is like, I've never like done the official improv, but like, I love doing things where I just randomly by myself, go into a bar and sit down at the bar and hope there's people I can entertain sitting next to me. <laughs> I've done that. Uh, and so that means that it's better if you meet new people, right? Because then they don't know any of your jokes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so anyway, we digress and, and it hopefully is entertaining for the people. So what, what's the next veer on the agenda there um, in, in your past? So you, yeah. is this at the point where you become uh, working as a coach full time? Are we there? Now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I quit, I quit my consulting and I let go of my actuarial designation, my qualification. That was hard. Yeah. That's your, that's your meal ticket. So that's really sweat, hard. blood and tears Yes, to, um, to qualify. And then I'm quitting. Right. But, uh, but I didn't want to keep up the 40 hours a week yeah. of, um, continuing credits that I had to do. So I right. let it go. And that was a big step in my life. Oh yeah. And then I did, think did I was on everybody in your life call you crazy and stupid and dumb and <laughs> you know because that's what no happened one, to me on my view no one did i think they were actually um admiring mm. and my parents i asked my mother once and she said well it's kind of a good story and i think they got something out of telling people he was super successful and now he's doing this this other thing and he's doing well at that right so i was on vroom vroom mode for quite a while now um I'd spent years diving into the, con to the coaching world and I quickly turned to coaching coaches because they were coming to me saying, how do you have clients in five countries? How do you work from home and choose your own hours? And, and how do choose you do all clients, this? Clients, right. <laughs> yeah, and I'm good with businesses and systems, so I naturally gravitated towards that. Um, I built, I, I achieved a number one ranking on Google for life coaching, which wow, if you've ever tried any yeah. search engine optimization, it's a big deal to get to number one. 
Did you do and, that like uh, uh, intentionally on purpose? Was that your goal? Oh, I really worked on SEO. Okay. Right, yeah, right. For okay. sure. Yeah. And that's and how it I usually built... doesn't happen naturally or, or organically. No. 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 You have to work on that. Yeah. And that's how I built my email list to 150,000. Wow. Uh, so someone called it the biggest, uh, the world's largest coaching business. And I think at the time that may have been true. Um, I created 10 digital products because okay. I, I love training. And so as I'd say something to my clients, I'd be like, all right, I got to write this down. So I created eBooks and DVDs and CDs. And then I actually let go of the coaching one-on-one gradually as, as my digital income right. started to increase. And, and then I wrote a book called get paid for who you are. And Jack Canfield from chicken soup was kind enough to write the forward of the book, which really helped oh, I yeah. had a lot of thought <laughs> um, promote the book and I started speaking on stages and selling from the stage and it was a really great career and that's when the next veer happened okay I got burned out mm, right I right. got burned out probably because I was pushing my adrenal glands too much and not taking care of my body right. and also I got tired of that same niche like I just I'd said everything I wanted to say right Right, right. For coaches, and I wanted to work with, still work with people on business, but different business models. And also, I wanted to work with people on their life. Like, let's get back to what really drove me when I first discovered personal growth and have people lean into their tough conversations, lean into truth, daring, and caring. I wanted to do that for, for the last 10, 15 years, but the other stuff was paying too well. Right, right. Right, right. Yes. So, so it you, took, you made your own golden handcuffs, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my system seems to be prone to anxiety and depression. So I've had that on and off over 20 years. Mm. And I was going through, I think, some depression um, maybe five, six years ago. And I was feeling burned out. And I thought, what would I do? Here's another six-month question, right? Before I said, if I had six months off from work, and could do anything, what would I do? Well, this time I asked myself, if I had six months to live, what would I do with my life? Wow. And the answer was, I would spend more time in Bali. Okay. Yeah. I've always loved the people. They were so special and they were so grateful that I was there to enjoy their country. I would go back and learn the language. So I went just two months, I said to my girlfriend, look, I'm going to go. I think this is my trip. If you really want to come, come with me. But I, I don't think you really do. Um, so I, I'm just going to go. I went. And while I was there, people would say to me, do you live here? And I thought, well, let me see what it sounds like to try it out. So I, I'd start saying yes, just to see how it felt. And you know what, Jeff? It felt pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so I went home and while I was there, we broke up, um, for good reasons. Okay. And, and then I, I went back, I sold everything that I had and, uh, I kept two suitcases worth of stuff and I took myself to Bali, uh, to, to see what life was going to be like there. And I'd already let go of the coaching, um, now I was letting go of the coaching income coming from the digital products because I just didn't want to email my list. I had nothing to email them. <laughs> I wasn't generating anything. I wasn't right, creating right. anything. Yeah, yeah. So I went to Bali and I'd like to say I did a whole bunch of spiritual healing and maybe I did, but really I spent eight months playing this one video game for eight hours a day. That's awesome. <laughs> 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 you I and I, we could, that reaction. we could hang out. <laughs> Dude, actually a lot about it was pretty damn awesome. And maybe I'll have another phase like that in my life because yeah. I can't just dabble in this game. Maybe if right. I download it, mm. I say out loud, I give my life to the game because I know I can't play it a little bit. <laughs> I love I went your action. So, I, I, went, I went through something similar. Um, so I found a game in 2016 and there's, there's a whole lot of drama around this game because it was a computer game and there was drama around the launch of the game and, and I had to buy a whole new computer to make it work. And then on the day that I got it to work finally, after like, you know, forever trying to make it work on my computer, um, I got it to work and then I had to go to work at a new job the next day. And I was like. 
oh, I'm in so much trouble. Because <laughs> I knew, just like you, that when I when I first played this game, I was like, yeah, oh my God, this is so my game that I know it's just going to take over my life. And at the same time, now I have to go spend eight hours or nine hours a day in an office doing crap I don't really want to do. <laughs> Yeah, I money. totally get it. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. then you get home and your reward is you get to yes, <clears throat> get yeah, that yeah. dopamine hit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I think like I, I was like going to say if I were to like do one of your breaks, like you said, like if I had six months to live or if I didn't want to do anything for six months, what would I do? Right. Um, if I were burnt out, it would be, you know, go to a beach, rent a place. Uh, you know, I want a, my computer there and I want my game there and I want Netflix there and maybe the beach, you know, for walking and hiking. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And not yeah. much else, you know, not a lot of work. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Yeah. Um, so that was a really exciting time. And then are you ready for the last veer? Yes, I'm ready. This has been great, right. by the way. Thank you. All right. All right. Great. So the last veer after two and a half years in Bali, I learned three languages there. Wow. Um, my goodness. Two, two so you weren't screwing Balinese. around on that computer the whole time? <laughs> no, no, that was just eight months. Okay. And then I, I let that go. Um, you know, I taught myself Java and, and created my own app called Get Real oh, nice. uh, for people to connect deeper in relationship. And I, you know, I did some things, sure. but I was pretty burned out. And then what happened was I was kicked out of the nest. Oh, no. I was subletting my villa to, uh, to tourists and, um, you can't do that in Bali. You can't, you can't do it in any country in the world, but most countries don't care if you're making a little bit of money by subletting a, um, your, a room in your house. Right. But in Bali, they care because you're taking away work from the locals and right. uh, it's, it's really not appropriate. Right. So um, what happened is I got busted for that and a guy showed up with a badge wow. and said I was wanted for questioning the next day. Now, I knew there'd be repercussions if I was ever caught, but I didn't realize how serious it could be. I didn't realize there was jail time Yikes. possibly attached to this wow. and that I could have to negotiate a huge bribe while I'm stewing in jail for weeks. <laughs> so Oof. it was wow, a you very really scary. In it. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. It was a very scary day. And I left Bali the same day. Wow. Um, under advice from a lawyer. Yikes. And, and, and that was difficult. And I, and I went back into some anxiety and depression, but I had to reinvent myself. Now I'd let go of this huge email list. I'd let go, uh, my search engine ranking. I'd right. let go, uh, yeah. my digital products. Yeah. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I don't even have this, this subletting. My, my identity for money is now gone basically. Yep. Yeah. And what happened is a friend said to me, you're a great coach. Why don't you go back to coaching? And I needed someone to say that. And I said, all right, but I've got to focus. I've got to pick a target market. I've got to know what I'd love to work on, something that people will pay for. Right. And it took, it's taken two years. Okay. It's been two years and three months since uh, that day that I left Bali. And now I've got the brand Play For Real and I've chosen the target market of high performers, they're already successful in so many areas, right. but they know there's more they can do in their business and they want their life to be amazing as well. Right. So they don't want a life coach. They don't want a business coach. They want someone who can actually handle both of those realms, which was quite rare. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and it's usually um, either or. Yeah. 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 And so now I help to get those people. I'm working in, with some executives. I'm working with some top entrepreneurs and I get to help them to live life now so that on their deathbed, they will have zero regrets. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that sounds like a really fun life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great. I even get to get in also on the flip side to balance that out and to give a little back, I get to go into prisons and to um, help prison inmates with the same issues, like more truth, daring and caring, uh, living a regret free life, even while they're, a cat they're a captive of the, of right. the state right and um and they're tough conversations ceos and prison mates inmates both face uh tough conversations in their lives we all do y yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 a really nice 
I know we're, we're, we have to wrap up and we can talk a little bit more about how people can best get in touch with you. But if we get to schedule some time, I want to know how you found this niche, this tough conversation thing, because that's, that's got to be a good story. <laughs> but we'll yeah. save it well, for the next well, show. Well, you got, you got the preview to it because yes. that first, when I first started coaching, that woman had to have that tough conversation. And then every personal growth program, they push me to go and have tough conversations. So that's the short version okay. of how I've been doing it for 20 years. Right, right. I realized this is something people aren't very good at. Right. And if they get good at it, their life's going to change. Ah, nice. So basically it's just like you had to boil everything you knew down to that. You know, those two words, tough conversations. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So talk a little bit about where people can get in touch with you as we wrap up. So what's the URL again? Uh, thank you, Jeff. The URL is playforreal.life. Right. I love that. And Thank you. And uh, I have three simple invitations. You can download the Tough Conversations Blueprint. If yeah. You I'm have one in your life and you want that. You can um, subscribe to my podcast called Tough Conversations with David Wood. That sounds like fun. And also, if something resonated for you in this interview and you're thinking, wait, could coaching be for me? See if you qualify for a discovery session. If you qualify for a discovery session, I don't charge you for it because it's how I find the right people to work with long term. Gotcha. And we'll create a plan for your life and business, oh, nice. uh, which I love doing anyway. Yeah. So all of that at playforreal.life. Perfect. Thank you, sir. This has been a blast. I appreciate you hanging out with me for about an hour. That was very generous of you. Thank you. My pleasure, Jeff. And this is one of my most fun interviews. I've never told my story from this, this lens of where was I on fast forward and where was there a veer or a pivot? So I love this. Thank you so much for your questions and for your podcast. And you've got and a great one. listening. <clears throat> I, if you enjoyed this and you love, love Jeff, please uh, s definitely subscribe to his podcast, but also rate and review it because that's how Jeff can climb in the rankings and more people can hear about Vroom Vroom Veer. Thank you, sir. Wow, that was really nice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. You too, mate. Ciao. Bye. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double -E E-R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Thank you.